Order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Bangham Debonair. Question number one, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. And I know that the whole House will join me in congratulating the British Olympic team on a a truly magnificent performance in Rio. That record medal hall second in the table ahead of China. And so many memorable moments. We can say they did themselves and their country proud. And I know that the whole House will wish to give our very best wishes to our Paralympic athletes and wish them the best of success. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Thangham Debonair. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And may I add my warm wishes to those of the Prime Minister, to all Paralympians and particularly Bristolians. I know they'll do us proud. Mr Speaker, I'm sure the whole House will be delighted that this country hosts a disproportionate number of the world's finest universities. However, some of them are saying that they are already being shut out of important collaborations with other fine universities in the European Union in anticipation of Brexit. This is such an important thing for important scientific, medical, engineering, other research and for our economic prosperity. In view of this, can the Prime Minister please tell us what her strategy is? Yeah. Prime Minister! Can I first of all say to the Honourable Lady how very good it is to see her in, this pla- in her place in this House? Uh, and on the issue of universities, of course we agree of the importance of our universities and the work that they do and the research collaboration that they have with a number of other countries, both within the EU and elsewhere. Uh, that's why earlier this summer my right honourable friend, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, made uh, an announcement gar- giving certain guarantees to universities in relation to funding decisions that are being taken by the European Union. We're standing behind our universities because we recognise the value that they bring to the country. Neil Parrish. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I very much welcome the statement from the Chancellor on support payments for farmers up to 2020 to give confidence to farming and the countryside. But I think, with trade deals now being done, British farmers produce some of the best welfare friendly and environmentally friendly food in the world. And we need to make sure that not both farming and the, the food processing industry is protected through trade deals that we do in the future. So I seek the reassurance from my right honourable friend. Yeah. Uh, my, my honourable friend is absolutely right. Uh, the announcement that I referred to just now in answer to the first question that the Chancellor gave also gave guarantees to the farming industry about the support that will be available to them up to 2020. But we do need to uh, recognise the very significant role that the food and farming industry plays in the United Kingdom. And of course, we will be looking to work with the sector. My right honourable friend, the Environment Secretary, will be doing that to see how we can develop those industries looking into the future, of course, uh, looking at the trade deals that we will be doing in future and how they will play their part. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I join the Prime Minister? in congratulating the entirety of the Olympic team for their fantastic achievements at the Olympics in Rio. Wish the Paralympic team all the very best. And can she tell us, did this set the visit off to China in a good way, or was there a bit of tension there when when, uh, bragging rights are allowed? Uh, Mr Speaker, the average house price in Britain is now £215,000, over eight times the average wage. The average price of a first-time buyer's home has risen by 12% in the past year. Isn't the dream of a home ownership for many people just that, a dream? First of all, in uh, response to the first point that the Right Honourable uh, Gentleman made, uh, I actually, President Xi congratulated me on the United Kingdom's success in the, uh, in the, Olympic, uh, in the Olympic Games. Uh, he raises the issue of house, uh, housing, which he's raised on a number of occasions with my predecessor, but also with me before we broke before the summer recess. And I will say simply this, of course, it is important for us to look at helping people get their first rung, their, their, their uh, step on the 
that first rung of the housing ladder and ensuring that people are able to have the home that they want. That is why I am pleased that house building has been up under a Conservative Government compared to a Labour Government, but we are not complacent. That is why we will be doing more to see more houses built under this Conservative Government and also continue to provide support for people to ensure that they have that financial support that helps them to own their own home. Yeah. Jeremy Corbyn. Actually, Mr Speaker, house building under this government is 45,000 a year less than it was under the last Labour government. And um, for, those, for those who are desperate to those who are desperate to get their own place. I just refer the Prime Minister to a note I received from a lady called Jenny, whose partner and herself, whose partner and herself work in a supermarket earning £7.37 an hour each. They are trying to get a mortgage and they have been told they can borrow £73,000. Not much hope for them then. The former Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Member for Whitney, promised that there would be a one-for-one replacement for every council house that is sold under Right to Buy. Sadly, the reality is there is only one for every five that are sold. Will the Prime Minister give us a commitment on the one-for-one replacement and when it will be a reality? Prime Minister. Well, first of all, can I say to Jenny that I fully understand and appreciate the concerns that individuals have about wanting to be able to have their own home and to uh, set up that home, and I fully recognise the difficulties that there are for some people in doing that. I have to say to the right honourable gentleman that actually in relation to the figures on council houses he's wrong. Uh, we have delivered on the one-for-one one, uh, replacement on the right to buy. But I was... Um, I am very interested, I'm very interested because I, I did notice that the Right Honourable Gentleman had asked all his Twitter followers what questions he should ask me uh, this week, so I thought I, would, um, I thought I would look to see what sort of responses he had received. <laughs> I have to say that the first one was quite good. In fact, he might want to make sure he stays sitting down for this. <laughs> Lewis writes, does she know that in a recent poll on who would make a better Prime Minister? <laughs> Don't know scored higher than Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> Mr. 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 Speaker, what we do know is that whoever wins the Labour Party leadership, we're not going to let them anywhere near power again. Yeah! Yeah! Jeremy Corbyn! Yeah! Mr. Speaker, the uh, number of first time buyers has halved in the 20, last 20 years, and their average age has increased a great deal. There is a housing crisis in Britain. Ten million people now live in the private rented sector, many forced to claim housing benefit to cover costs of rents. Devastating figures released over this sh summer show that £9.3 billion of public money is paid through housing benefit directly into the pockets of private landlords. Does the Prime Minister think this £9.3 billion into the private rental market is really money well spent? I, I, have to to the, uh, I have to say to the right honourable gentleman that he is he talk, starts off talking about the importance of people actually being able to be in their own homes and then challenges one of the measures that actually helps people to get into their own homes through housing benefit support in the private rented sector. So it may be that he just has an ideological objection to the private rented sector. What I say is what this government is doing is ensuring, ensuring that what we are doing is looking across the board. So we will see more houses being built. We are looking to ensure that there is a diversity of uh, opportunity for people in terms of getting, these, uh, uh, getting their own home. But I have, to, uh, I have to say to the right honourable gentleman that uh, uh, everything that he says just tells us what all we need to know about modern labour. Uh, the trains left the station, the seats are all empty, the leaders on the floor, even on rolling stock, they're a laughing stock. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, um, Mr. Speaker, her predecessor, Mr. Speaker, her predecessor, 
by discussing this issue said the simple point is that every penny you spend on housing subsidy is money you cannot spend on building houses. And I, if landlords rent out houses in a very bad state, such as heavy, damp, wet walls, no working toilet, they need to be getting a fine. The government has to regulate. That's what Joyce wrote to me. And the Citizens Advice Bureau says one sixth of housing benefit goes to the private sector landlords renting out unsafe homes. Does the Prime Minister think this really is a satisfactory state of affairs? I say to the uh, right honourable gentleman uh, that if he thinks that housing benefit is actually such a bad thing, why was it that when we changed the rules on housing benefit, the Labour Party opposed those changes that we took place? Now, we have changed. He talks about bad landlords. We have changed the rules on selective licensing. Uh, We are making changes. We've given councils free reign to uh, impose uh, burdens and bureaucracy on landlords would lead. Giving councils free reign to impose burdens and bureaucracy would lead, we think, to problems within the market, which would actually lead to higher costs for both tenants and landlords. We're introducing new regulations in relation to housing in uh, in multiple occupation. So we are looking at all of these issues. I recognise as every member of Parliament in this House will, the problems that people sometimes have when they are living in accommodation that is not up to the standard that we would all wish to see people living in. That is why we are looking, we are changing the rules, and we are ensuring that the regulations are there. Jeremy Corbyn. Well, that is extremely interesting, Mr Speaker, because only a year ago the Prime Minister voted against a Labour amendment to the Housing Bill, which quite simply said all homes for rent in the private rented sector should be fit for human habitation. And just over a year ago, the Treasury estimated that it is losing half a billion pounds per year on unpaid tax from landlords renting in the private rented sector. So we have it, £9.5 billion in housing benefit, half a billion pounds not being collected, a very large number of homes not really fit for human habitation. Doesn't this require government intervention on the side of the tenant and those in housing need? Prime Minister. The Right Honourable Gentleman asks for the Government to intervene. The Government has, through the Housing and Planning Act, introduced further tough measures, civil civil penalties, banning orders for serious offences, extending uh, repayment orders. We have provided money so local authorities can conduct more inspections of uh, of properties, of people's homes. We have seen more people, uh, more properties being inspected. We now see thousands of landlords facing further action. So far from not taking action in this area, the Government has. But I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman this. He may have a model of society where he does not want to see private landlords, uh, where he wants to see the Government owning everything, the Government deliberating on, on everything, the Government doing everything for everybody. That is not what we want. We want opportunities for people. We want to help them to take those opportunities. It's a big difference between him and me. Of course we all recognise there is a mixed housing economy, but we want to make sure that those living in the private rented sector are properly treated and not having to pay excessive levels of rent. Women's Aid, Mr Speaker, has uh, said that two-thirds of women refuges are going to close because of the benefit cap when it comes into force, and that 87 per cent of um, women and children who are in those refuges will suffer as a result of it, and that most of those refuges require an income level that comes mainly from housing benefit. Ninety per cent of their income comes from it. Does the Prime Minister recognise these are very vulnerable women in those refuges? Closure of those refuges it would be devastating for them, very dangerous for the most vulnerable people within our society. Would she take action to make sure that the cap does not apply to women's aid refuges at any part, in any part of Britain? Prime Minister. The, the Right Honourable Gentleman raises a very important issue. Uh, on the issue of domestic violence, we should, across this House, be doing all we can to stop this terrible crimes that are taking place and obviously to provide support to the victims and survivors of these crimes. That is why we are working uh, on exempting refugees from the cap uh, in relation to, uh, to what he speaks about. But I would also remind him, I would also remind him of the 
very good record that we have on domestic violence. It was a Conservative government that introduced the new offence of coercive control, that put into practice the domestic violence protection orders, that introduced Clare's law, that is, put, is putting £80 million into support for domestic violence victims uh, in the run up to. Uh, uh, in the period up to 2020. So we are listening to these problems and we are uh, responding to them and we all take this very seriously indeed. But I say to the right honourable gentleman as well, it's 50, 50 days, I think it is, since he and I last met across this dispatch box. Uh, uh, nice to see you, he says. Well, it's, it's very good to see him sitting in his place. Still. And I have to say... Uh, if we just look at the contrast of what's been done over this summer, the Conservative government has been working tirelessly to support everyone in this country. £250 million of loans to small businesses, introduced the uh, racial disparity audit, looking at public services and how they treat people, uh, and of course setting the groundwork for new trade deals around the world. What we've seen, what a contrast. What, what a contrast with the party opposite, divided amongst themselves and incapable of uniting our country. What we do know is that there is only one party that is going to provide a country, a government, an economy, a society that works for everyone, and that's the Conservative Party. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Last week, the Children's Society published a report which showed that 10% of children feel that their lives have little meaning or purpose. I know that the Prime Minister understands the importance of tackling mental health because she raised it in her Downing Street speech. What further action does she propose to increase mental health support in our schools? Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, my my honourable friend raises a very important point, and I think there has been a collective concern about the issue of the way in which mental health is, uh, is dealt with. And that is why uh, we put a record £1.4 billion into transforming the dedicated mental health support that is available to young people across the country. Uh, and that includes £150 million for services to support children and young people with eating disorders. Uh, there are various other things. We are publishing a blueprint for school counselling services, because my honourable friend is right that the role that schools play is very important in this. And I know that my right honourable friend, the Education Secretary, is going to be looking very closely at the Good Childhood Report to see what more there is that we can do. Brangus Robertson. Yeah. I join with the Prime Minister and the leader of the Labour Party in praising uh, all Olympians and this is the first day of the Paralympics. Wish all Paralympians from all parts of these islands well. They're an inspiration to yeah. us all. Yeah. 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 Uh, Mr Speaker, there's very real concern and uh, worry about the prospects of Brexit, especially in Scotland where the majority of people voted to remain within the yeah. European Union. Yeah. 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 Uh, the UK government has had all summer to come up with a plan, to come up with a strategy. So far, we've just had waffle. So may I ask the Prime Minister a very simple question, but it's quite important. Does she want the UK to remain fully within the European single market? Yeah. Yeah. Minister. What, I, what I want for the UK is that we put into place, uh, into practice, the vote that was taken by the, the UK people of the United Kingdom to leave the European yeah. Union. That we, get, uh, that we get the right deal for the trade in goods and services with the European Union in a new relationship that we will be building with them, and that we uh, also introduce control of the movement of people from the European Union into the United Kingdom. And I say to the right honourable gentleman that we can approach the vote that took place on the 23rd of June in two ways. We could try and row back on it, we could have a second referendum, we could say we didn't really believe it. Actually, we are respecting the views of the British people. But, but, but more than that, more than that, we will be seizing the opportunities that leaving the European Union now gives us to forge a new role for the United Kingdom in the world. Angus Robertson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And we on these benches respect the views of the people of yep. Scotland who voted That's to right. remain. must be heard. 
and he will be heard. Mr Angus Robertson. Mr Speaker, the European single market is the biggest market in the world, and it really matters to our businesses and it really matters to our economy. I ask the Prime Minister a very, very simple question. There's either an in or an out answer, so let me ask it again. Does she want the United Kingdom to remain fully part of the European single market? Yes or no? Prime Minister. The right honourable gentleman doesn't seem to quite understand what, what the vote on the 23rd of June was about. The United Kingdom will leave the European Union and we will build a new relationship with the European Union. That new relationship will, e- will include control of the movement of people from the EU into the UK and it will include the right deal for trade in goods and services. That is how to approach it. And I also say this to the right honourable gentleman. In looking at negotiations, it would not be right for me or this government to give a running commentary on negotiations. Just as I said, the right honourable gentleman must be heard. The Prime Minister's answer must be heard. And it will be, the Prime Minister. And it would not be right for us to prejudge those negotiations. We will be ensuring that we seize the opportunities for growth and prosperity across the whole United Kingdom, including growth and prosperity in Scotland. And as we saw from figures released this summer, what really gives growth and prosperity in Scotland is being a member of the United Kingdom. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week, hundreds of local residents and businesses attended my faster broadband fair. Many of those with the very slowest speeds claimed a £500 voucher from Connecting Devon and Somerset to fund an alternative broadband connection capable of delivering at least 10 megabits per second. Will the Prime Minister join me in congratulating Somerset County Council on this excellent scheme and confirm that the Government remains committed to delivering a universal service obligation of at least 10 megabits per second by 2020? Prime Minister. I'm, I'm very happy to give my honourable friend that assurance and also to join with him in paying tribute to his council and the work that they're doing and indeed all those involved in that innovative scheme. High speed broadband is an important part of the 21st century infrastructure. We will be doing everything we can to ensure it is there and available for people because that will enable us to develop jobs and grow prosperity in this country. Richard Arkless. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Penman Engineering, established in 1859, was forced into administration in my constituency this week by one debtor who is a recipient of huge public sector contracts. But, Mr Speaker, I can't name the debtor. It's an impossible position. Penman has to continue to trade with this debtor as well as pursuing the debt. Will the Prime Minister put me in touch with the Business Secretary, please, to discuss potential export support that can be given? And how can we ensure that these companies who receive enormous amounts of public money don't hold our supply chain to ransom and pay the bills on time? Prime Minister. First of all, can I say to the Honourable Gentleman that, of course, our thoughts are with all those families who were affected uh, by what has happened to Penman Engineering. Uh, the administrator does have a role in ensuring that any sale of the business protects the maximum number of jobs, uh, and my right honourable friend, the, Secretary, the Scottish Secretary, has made clear that that is his priority, and I hope that the Scottish Government will offer their support to this long-standing business. As I say, our thoughts are with all those who have been affected, and obviously the administrator will be looking to ensure that the, the the best possible uh, op- options are found for the company. Mr. Jenkins. Yeah, yeah. 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 In adding my congratulations to the many she has received on her appointment as, as Prime Minister, may I just comment that following the EU referendum and under her leadership, I feel more confident about the future of this country than ever in my lifetime. She beware those who are trying to make leaving the European Union ever more complicated and protracted. And to that end, uh, order. order. Progress is very slow, but there's far too much noise. The honourable gentleman will be heard. Yeah. It's as simple as that. He will be heard, Mr. Jenkins. Mr. Speaker, and to that end, will she confirm that there is really no basis in law? to require the Government to seek the permission of Parliament before invoking Article 50. Prime Minister. 
I thank my honourable friend for his, uh, for his comments. And he's absolutely right. Uh, the government's position is very clear. This is a, a, a prerogative power. Uh, it's a power that can be exercised by the government. And as he uh, alludes to in his uh, question, I don't think anybody should be in any doubt that those people who are trying to prolong the process by their legal references in relation to uh, Parliament are not those who want to see us successfully leaving the European Union. They're those who actually want to try and stop us from leaving the European Union. Andrew Gwynn. Thank you. The Prime Minister seems less keen than her predecessor on the Northern Powerhouse, but she also says that post-Brexit Britain is open for business. So where better in 2025 than the great city of Manchester to host the World Expo, the home of the world's first programmable computer, where the atom was split and where graphene was invented to showcase the best of Britain to the world and the best of the world to Britain. Will she back our bid? Yeah. Prime Minister! Well, I say to the honourable gentleman, I'm very interested to hear the lobby that he's uh, making for Manchester, and I will, of course, look at what he said very seriously. And can I say how pleased I am that Manchester is going to be hosting the parade for our, our uh, Olympic athletes? James yeah. Gray! Mr Speaker, in this um, post-Brexit world, will the Prime Minister agree with me that NATO is a more important than ever cornerstone of the nation's defences, particularly Article 5, which, which lays down that an attack on one is an attack on all? And would the Prime Minister agree with me that any politician who will not sign up to that commitment, or even worse, who tells NATO that they should give up, go home and go away, is recklessly risking the defence of the realm? Yeah, yeah. Prime Minister! I absolutely agree with my honourable friend on all the points that he's made. We must never forget the importance of NATO. It's the cornerstone of our defence and security, and that strength is based on the fact that all of those partners within NATO have committed uh, to Article 5 and to operating under the base, on the basis of Article 5. And anybody who says, who rejects that, is rejecting that security and that defence. They'd be undermining our national security, but also they'd be undermining the national security of our allies. And what we know from the Labour Party is that far from delivering stronger defence, they would cut defence spending, they'd undermine NATO, and they'd scrap the nuclear deterrent. Margaret Ritchie! Thank you, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister, I've just had a debate in Westminster Hall on the police ombudsman's report into the Loch Island massacre, in which six men were shot dead by the UVF in a period of direct rule in my constituency. I received a letter from her predecessor in which he acknowledged this unspeakable evil and assured me that the government accepts the police ombudsman's report and that any allegations of police misconduct are taken very seriously. Will the Prime Minister now detail what action she will take to ensure that prosecutions are pursued, an apology is forthcoming from the government and a compensation is provided for lost lives? Prime Minister. I say to the Honourable Lady, she's absolutely right. What happened at Lockheed Island was a terrible, uh, terrible evil. And I'm sure that everybody across the House will want to join me in expressing our sympathies to all those who were affected by the appalling atrocity. As she has said, and as uh, the, my right honourable friend, the Member for Whitney, said, the Government accepts the Police Ombudsman's report and the Chief Constable's response. It is important that where there are allegations of police misconduct, those are taken seriously and those are properly looked into. If there has been wrongdoing, it must be pursued. Obviously, it's now a matter for the PSNI, uh, though I would remind her that the Chief Constable has been very clear that he wants to ensure that, uh, that he is determined that where there has been wrongdoing, people will be brought to justice. Mr Richard Fuller. Mr Speaker, a long-running review into hospital services in Bedford and Milton Keynes was an abject failure that lost all credibility with local people, uh, for example, by publishing recommendations for significant changes to services and then refusing to answer any questions. So can the Prime Minister assure me that the sustainability and transformation plans for Bedfordshire and elsewhere to be released by NHS England will be subject to proper local accountability and full local decision authority? Uh, well, I say to my honourable friend that it is absolutely the point of these uh, uh, plans is that they should be locally driven that they will be considered locally, they should be taking into account uh, the uh, concerns and interests locally, not just of the clinical commis commissioning groups, but of the local authorities and of the public. <laughs> These must be plans that are driven from the locality, so I give my honourable friend that assurance. Jeff Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, nearly two million people signed up to vote in the European Union referendum earlier this year. 
it's surely right that constituencies should be based on the actual electorate that wants yeah. to vote. Yeah. 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 So is the Prime Minister concerned that the boundary review is going ahead next week without including those two million voters? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. I say to the Honourable Gentleman that all parties across this House actually supported the proposal that the Boundary Commission would follow this timetable, would bring forward these uh, proposals, and that by 2018 those uh, Boundary Commission proposals would be, would be put in place. Uh, all parties supported that, and I continue to support it. Charlie Elphick. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Does the Prime Minister share my anger? that on the weekend of the 23rd of July, up to 250,000 people on the roads to Dover were stuck in gridlock in the sweltering heat for up to 17 hours without food, water or even able to go to the loo. And will she support my campaign to make sure we get better infrastructure to the channel ports, starting with the lorry park and car park on the M20 and duelling the A2 and getting some proper motorways to Dover? Prime Minister. Thank you. I, I, uh, I say to my honourable friend, he has been a passionate advocate for um, the support for his local area, given the, uh, some of the pressures that Dover finds itself under in re- as, uh, as a cross-channel port. It is an important issue. We are committed to providing support. The money for the lorry park, of course, was announced last November. The uh, site was announced in July, and I believe consultation is now taking place on the potential design for that particular site. On the issue of the possible duelling of the A2, he's right that we uh, want want to support local infrastructure uh, to be able to handle the growth in traffic, particularly given that there are expansion plans for the port. And I assure him that Dover will be considered as part of the planning for the next road investment strategy. Lynn Hayes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As many children return to school this week, I'm sure the Prime Minister will join me in wishing them all the very best for the school year ahead. Will she also provide reassurance to my constituents and to children across London that the objectives of changes to the school's funding formula will be achieved by levelling up, not levelling down, and that funding for schools in London will not be cut by up to 20 per cent? Prime Minister. Uh, I, I join the Honourable Lady in wishing all those going to, uh, going to school, many for the first time, well in their uh, education. I hope what we will be aiming to do is ensuring that every child has the education that's right for them and the opportunities that are right for them. I think it is right that we look at the national funding formula, but that will be done carefully to see what the impact will be across all parts of the country. Sturney. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. World leading universities are one of our country's great assets. So, when um, I next meet with the Vice Chancellor of York University to discuss Brexit and higher education, what assurances can I pass to him from my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, that our universities will continue to receive the vital funding they need to thrive beyond 2020? Prime Minister. Uh, I say to my honourable friend, again, he raises an important point about uh, the relevance and significance of our universities. My right honourable friend, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, was uh, able to give confidence and reassurance to universities in the summer about the funding arrangements that will continue while we are still members of the European Union. And while we're members of the European Union, we will maintain our full rights of obligation and obligations of membership and expect uh, others to deal with us on that, uh, on that same basis. Of course, looking ahead, we have a higher education bill that is going through this House, which is about how we can ensure that we are seeing the places, the university places available in this country to provide the education that we want to provide. We have a great record on higher education in this country. We want to build on that and develop it for the future. Tom Brake. I would like to put to the Prime Minister a request, which I know she will think is reasonable. My local hospital, St Helier Hospital, which delivers uh, high, high, is a high-performing uh, hospital and delivers excellent care, but was built in the 1930s and is in need of very substantial investment. Uh, will she agree to earmark the first two weeks of the £350 million uh, that is going to be available each week post-Brexit uh, to spend on the reconstruction of my hospital? Yeah. Uh, well, I have to say to the, uh, the Honourable Gentleman, his question tempts me to go down a number of routes in, uh, in answering him. Uh, what I would say is I recognise the important importance of his local hospital trust, and I am pleased to say that over the last six years we have seen more doctors and more nurses in that trust able to provide more services and more facilities. And Indeed, since 2010, the capital spend in the, tr- in the trust has already gone up. 72, is, is, uh, se- has been £72.7 million. Pounds. We will be looking to ensure that we provide the health service that is right for everyone in this country. Philip Hollabone. 
At the moment, there are 80 vulnerable elderly patients in Kettering General Hospital awaiting delayed transfer to social care. The national guideline says there should be 25. In the next few weeks, the number is likely to rise to 200, the highest in the country, with a similar number at Northampton General Hospital, because of proposals by Northamptonshire County Council to extend social care assessments from three days to four weeks. In order to prevent this crisis, will the Prime Minister authorise a joint meeting of local government and health ministers, county MPs, the local NHS and the county council to bang heads together to prevent this crisis from happening? Yes. Prime Minister. I, what I will say to my honourable friend I will do is ensure that the health department is aware of the request that he has put forward. Uh, and I will say to you, there is. Everybody, I think, in this House is well aware of the uh, challenge that we have in relation to the interaction of social care with the hospitals. This is an issue that we have already looked at. We've put money into the Better Care Fund. We've been looking at the work, better working together of health services and uh, social care and social services under local authorities. But it is one of the challenges that we see. There are some areas where this is being done very well. Uh, and I think it is right that we look at those and try to spend, uh, spread that good practice. But I will make sure that the Health Department is aware of the concern my honourable friend has shown. Caroline Lucas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Nine months after signing the Paris Climate Agreement, the Government still hasn't ratified the treaty. And according to the Committee on Climate Change, it lacks half the policies it needs to meet its climate targets. With a delayed carbon reduction plan and the very real risk of missing our renewable energy targets, Will the Prime Minister take this opportunity to reassure people that it remains committed to climate action? Will it follow the example of the 26 states that have already ratified, including the US and China? Will it give us a firm date for ratification before the follow-up negotiations in November? We, uh, well, I'm happy to give the Honourable Lady the assurance that we will indeed be ratifying the, uh, the Paris Agreement. Uh, indeed, my right honourable friend, the current Home Secretary, as then as Energy Secretary, played a very key role in ensuring that that Paris Agreement was actually achieved. But I would also hope that the Honourable Lady will want to congratulate the Government. We've been identified as being the second best country in the world for tackling climate change. Yeah. I would have hoped she would have congratulated us on that. Carol yeah. Gillen. Speaker, um, today is World Duchenne Awareness Day, which is designed to draw attention to a terrible muscle wasting disease that affects a small number of young men. On this day, will the Prime Minister join me in welcoming the recent announcement that the drug Translana is now going to be available to these young boys in NHS England? And will she congratulate my constituent Archie Hill? Muscular Dystrophy UK and all those colleagues in this House and some former ministers that worked so hard to make this life-changing drug available in this country. Prime Minister. Yes, I'm very happy to uh, uh, join my right honourable friend in uh, congratulating all those who were involved in making sure that this innovative drug is available. And I thank her for raising awareness of what is a very important issue. I know that my, uh, the Right Honourable Member for Whitney, as Prime Minister, met, uh, uh, met Archie, a young man uh, with Duchesne's muscular dystrophy, and was inspired uh, by him. And I'm sure that all members across this House will welcome the fact that this innovative drug is now available on the NHS, and we're committed to making sure that patients with rare conditions get access to the latest medicines and indeed are taking some bold steps to speed up that process. Now, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Will the Prime Minister join me and I, I'm sure the whole of the rest of the House in sending our deepest sympathy and sincere condolences to the family and friends of Roseanne Cooper and her 10-year-old nephew, Micaiah McDermott, who were mown down by a stolen car in Penge last week? Can we also send the best wishes to the three other young girls who are involved, again, all family members? Whilst other inquiries, including by the police and the Independent Police Complaints Commission, are being undertaken, and the matter is now before the courts, uh, I'll say no more about the specific case, other than to ask the Prime Minister if she's aware of the widespread public concern that the law on causing death by dangerous driving is wholly inadequate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And will she undertake a review both of its suitability 
and its applicability as the courts actually enact it. Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, can I first of all join the Honourable Member in expressing our sympathies to all those who were involved in this terrible uh, accident that took place, this terrible tragedy when this stolen car, as he said, uh, mowed down two people and affected others as well. Uh, I'm aware of the concern that there is about the law in relation to dangerous driving. I've had a particular case about an, an, uh, the daughter of some of my constituents who uh, suffered, uh, was killed as a result of, of uh, uh, dangerous driving. And they've raised concerns with me specifically about their case. Uh, and this is a matter that I believe the Justice Department is looking at. Order.